from Western New York's only 24-hour news channel. This is a News 4 update. Good morning. It's 16 degrees at 304. I'm Mary Murray. Convicted drug king Del Reese Johnson will spend the rest of his life in jail. Johnson of Buffalo could have faced a death penalty for the crimes he committed during his days with the L.A. Boys drug gang. The Newark International Airport is set to reopen in three hours. Electricity was actually accidentally cut off at the nation's 10th largest airport by a construction worker who drilled into a cable. The closing of the airport inconvenienced thousands of travelers, including many here in Buffalo. We'll have more news in an hour on your only 24-hour news channel. Four stands for news. 24 hours a day. Hi, I'm Nancy Glass. American Journal brings you the most compelling stories from Buffalo to Anchorage. Every night at 7.30 here on Western New York's only 24-hour news channel. For round-the-clock weather, call the Skywatch 4 Dunn Tire weather line. So the advice out of here, if you live near a burn area, you better get those sandbags ready. In Los Angeles, Thelma Gutierrez for CBS News. A new step on the road to peace or the calm before the storm. Is Moscow's offer of a ceasefire working for now? There have been a few explosions early this morning, but a ceasefire which apparently took hold today is being observed. Russia's offer of a truce came after a day of brutal fighting in the capital of Grozny. The Interfax News Agency says two-thirds of the Chechen capital is now in Russian hands. In Moscow, Boris Yeltsin stayed out of sight as members of his government argued over how to end the fighting. Everyone in Moscow agrees on one point, that the Chechen campaign is a disaster, and the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. CBS News correspondent Alan Pizzi reports. The memorial service for the highest-ranking Russian officer to die in Chechnya was a lot like the campaign there, makeshift. General Viktor Vorobiev died when a mortar shell exploded next to him. And while his comrades in arms and family mourned, the public here seems to blame the military high command for the mess in Chechnya. Vorobiev was the first Russian general to die in combat since Afghanistan, and comparisons to that fruitless foray are creeping into minds here. Mothers of soldiers fighting in Chechnya stayed to small protest near the Kremlin, but the anti-war movement is in its infancy at best. The political future of Boris Yeltsin seems to be of greater concern than the war itself. His political survival has been an issue since the debacle in Chechnya began. We have relatives in Grozny and we don't know what has happened to them, he says. So far, there is no one I can see who can replace Yeltsin. We don't need to get rid of Yeltsin, this woman says. We need to get rid of his circle of advisors. Alan Fizzi, CBS News, Moscow. Coming up, Great Escapes with CD-ROM and how to get logged on if your computer illiterate. Stay with us. This is CBS News, up to the minute. Before nightfall, 40,000 children will die from hunger and disease. 55 will die before I finish talking. They're dying because to most of us, they're nameless, faceless masses, too numerous to help. But they each have a name and they can be helped one by one. If you can set aside 70 cents a day, $21 a month, then please call this number and sponsor a child like Maria. Maria might be a statistic now, if it weren't for Angela Toth, a homemaker from Michigan. Before Angela sponsored Maria through Christian Children's Fund, the situation was very bad. Maria and her mother were alone and frightened. Maria's father had been kidnapped. And with no source of income, it's pretty tough to get along in this part of the country. But Maria will, thanks to Angela. Now they share pictures, letters, their joys, sadness. Thousands of children, just as precious as Maria, die every day. Not because people are heartless, but because we feel powerless. How many times have you heard child mortality statistics and thought, the problem's so big, what can I do? You can do plenty. You can pick up the phone and save one child. That's a great feeling. Meet Jose, sponsored by Scott Blevins, a Florida technician. Jose is just getting over pneumonia, which is usually fatal here. You see, where Jose lives, there's no clean water, no medicine, nothing but poverty. But with Scott's $21 a month, Christian Children's Fund is able to give Jose good food, clean water, warm clothes, and the penicillin that saved his life. The only thing we can't save you from is your school work. Christian Children's Fund can do a lot with your $21. Remember, your phone call can make a wonderful difference in the life of a child. The number for Christian Children's Fund is on your screen. Please call it.
We'll send you the name and photo of a child you can sponsor. 90s, and there are people out there who have managed not to log on, to stay offline, whose kids speak fluent DOS. If that sounds like you, if you want to learn, but fear the world of the computer unknown, take heart. You may soon have a friend to hold your hand and guide you into the computer age. His name is Bob, and Herb Weissbaum has his story. The Microsoft marketing machine pulled out all the stops for this one, from planes in the air to a marching band on the ground. Bob was everywhere. Bob is more than just a new piece of software. It's a new way of interacting with a computer. The standard menu screens are gone, replaced with an on-screen room, one you choose and design. The various objects in the room let you control Bob's eight different programs. But what makes Bob newsworthy is the way you interact with it, using your personal guide, a cartoon character on the screen, like Rover or Java the Dragon. Hey! These guides help show you what to do, suggesting options, providing tips. The guides have what's called active intelligence. According to Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates, they're smart enough to know what you're doing. It has a sense of, are you having to pause for a long time to come up with something, and so maybe it, it should give you more help. The whole idea behind Bob is to get people who are afraid of computers to give them a try. That's why they decided to call it Bob. They felt that it, uh, that it needed an incredibly approachable, personal, uh, friendly name that would get across very quickly to people that this product is going uh, to be like your friend like, and make it your PC. The idea of personalizing a computer came from research conducted at Stanford University. It showed that people want to interact with computers in a social way. It's just like TV. And if you could, and we know how accessible and how enjoyable and how effective television is. So if you could get a computer to be just like TV, everyone can do it. Yo, yo, yo. But what if Bob's too helpful? Some computer users may not want to get that friendly with their PC. At its display booth, Microsoft demonstrators are assuring people there's no need to worry about that. You don't have to have the help. If you just want to start typing and do your own thing, you can do that. Never, you know, we don't. We try very hard not to force the help on you. In fact, Microsoft says Bob is smart enough to learn how much help you need. In other words, when to leave you alone. One of the real underlying technologies here is your character learns over time how much interaction you want, how much help you want, how many tips you want. Bob is coming, but not just yet. It'll be in stores March 31st with a suggested retail of about $99. Now keep in mind this new software won't run on every computer. You need a 486 with at least 8 megabytes of memory. Most new computers sold today will run Bob. At the Consumer Electronics Show, Herb Weissbaum for CBS News, Las Vegas. Sales of computer games have been giving Hollywood a run for its money at the cash register, and by the end of 1995, there will reportedly be 17 million people using CD-ROMs for games, education, and information. That market is exploding, which brings us to a new feature on Up to the Minute, the Up to the Minute, or UTTM CD-ROM rating. Hollywood is in on the act, putting another world on these little discs. Here now, the first UTTM CD-ROM rating. And joining us is Heather Pemberton, news editor for CD-ROM Professional. Good morning. Good morning. 17 million folks. That's a lot of people. I'm surprised it's really exploded that much. CD-ROM market is hot today. It was only a few years ago that CD-ROM drives cost $1,000. And today you can get a double-speed drive for under $200. Actually, some are available for under $100. Okay, it's close to the middle of January now. Cold in a lot, a lot of parts of this country. Take me someplace warm. We're going to take a look at the Caribbean, and we're going to look for a place to stay in the Caribbean. We're going to look at a disc called Villas of the Caribbean that shows different lodging places to go. We can take a look at a map of the region, and from there, choose an island. I'm going to go to the British Virgin Islands, head straight for Tortola. I can click on the island. It'll give me a detailed map of the island. And little gray boxes show where villas are that I can explore. I feel like I should be drinking a margarita right now. The music definitely helps the ambiance. <laughs> and that's something you get with CD-ROM. Right. Now if we go down to Peter Island, which is right next to Tortola, it shows us a detailed picture of a place to stay. We can choose one to explore and then look at a detail. Here we can see seasonal rates, a weekly price. It's not cheap. It's about $5,000 for the week. $5,000? 
So this is for the well-heeled traveler, right? Definitely. No Definitely. Holiday Inns on the cd rom No, I couldn't find any at reasonable rates. It also has a description. Most of these properties have televisions, jacuzzis, they're on the beachfront. Then I can go in and take a look at the villa itself. Wow. I can see that it actually has ocean views. It has a lovely deck you can stand on, uh -huh. a deck off the bedroom. Now, can I book this villa through, through the computer? Actually, or? you can't. Actually, okay. you can't. There isn't an online connection. You're going to have to make a phone call yourself. There's a general agency here where you can call up. But, but Heather, why not use a travel agent? Well, the and reason I wouldn't use a travel agent is because this has enough photos that you can look at that you wouldn't find in a book. You wouldn't find in a brochure. Will a travel agency give you this, or do you have to buy it? No, you have to go these? to a store and buy it or order it through a catalog. Okay, and we're talking about $50, $60, right? Well, some of them you can find for as low as 30 but generally they're priced at around $50. Okay. So, well, when I'm in the Caribbean, I want to do a couple of things, I guess, in the water, probably, right? So like we have another deep disc. Sea, deep sea diving, maybe? Another disc we can look at. Okay. And that's Oceans Below. And here, if we click on the scuba mask, we can begin a dive in Belize. Warm Belizean water. This area has the second largest barrier reef in the world. Gives it's us a little bit of overview information, and then I can descend. Wow. A little multimedia diving experience here. Yeah, there's a nice little video to take you down. So this shows you the equipment that you need. Once we get gives you a sense of the, the experience of diving? Yeah, it all, it really gives you that multimedia sense by showing the video, taking you underwater. This is going to take us down on the dive a little bit and then show us some of the fish. fish. For example, here's now a stingray. Down. If we click on the stingray, we get a full motion there's video down here at night. of Most a fish crabs, underwater. Like coral crab or bottom dwellers. And there's a cuttlefish. It's unique in the way it uses its lateral fins to swim through the water. So it helps you identify the sea creatures before you even... Right, we can actually view them. And this is, this is something that you couldn't get in a book. This is something where multimedia brings the video... Here we're going to ascend. Brings the video and the underwater to your desktop. As you ascend, repeatedly release small amounts of air from your BC to prevent you from making a rapid... And it gives you some information about how to ascend. What? Great. Now, this isn't a replacement for a full scuba course. No, yeah. I would imagine not. And, and they have a disclaimer in it, but it's a nice way to see some of the places you could explore. What about a more heart-pounding sport experience? Well, we also have Extreme Sports, which is a title for people who find scuba diving a little too mellow. starts with a video cube that shows us where we can explore, air, land, snow, or water. Welcome to Meteo's Extreme Sports. It's too easy to simply equate extreme sports with... We're going to click on water. The video cube shatters and takes us to our first sustaining role in his life. port of the morning. Curiosity made and that's going to be whitewater kayaking. In a calm river in a kayak is like Formula One There's a general overview and on the right are some options. We can look at a video, we can get some history of the sport, we can go to the best places to, uh, to kayak, and we can even look at the gear. So you can actually whitewater kayak without risking life and limb. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> Now we can go back to the cube, say, okay, we're a little too wet, we want to explore something else. We're going to go up in the air this time. And here I found some sports I didn't even know existed. One of them was sky surfing. And I think that's the first one we're going to take a look at. Sky surfing, or jumping out of an airplane with a snowboard and a parachute on, was once simply the maniac fringe of freestyle skydiving. Now it is a recognized sport in its own right. And so here again, we get another overview, uh -huh. and then we go to a video segment. As well as more... So again, all we need at home is the CD-ROM hard drive, right? 
We need a CD-ROM drive. We need about 8 megabytes of RAM. We need a 256 color monitor. And we need about a 486 processor for a PC. So we need more than just the So drive. we need quite a bit to run these programs. It's going to set you back how much? Well, you can find a PC system for under 2000 okay. It's not ex as expensive as it used to be, so. Well, it looks like a lot of fun. I think it is. Heather Pemerton, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be back after this. This is CBS News up to the minute. How about poor Fred Wilson? Uh, what a shame. So soon after retiring. I hear his wife needed help with the funeral expenses. Oh, oh that's ridiculous. He had Social Security. Oh, when my brother died, his wife received a check from Social Security, all right, for $255. Oh. Funeral costs were more than $4,000. No. How on earth did she pay for it? Fortunately, my brother bought some additional life insurance a few years before he retired. I'll bet that costs a pretty penny, huh? Like with Colonial Pen, each unit costs just $6.95 a month. Yeah. Less than 25 cents a day. I have it myself. We both do. Both of you? <laughs> That's right. Neither one of us had to answer any health questions or take a physical exam. In fact, no one our age can be turned down, regardless of health. No one? <laughs> no. Is this a plan that offers a lot of protection at first and then reduces it little by little each year? No, 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 no. I've had this coverage for years. My benefit never decreases. Your rates go up every year, right? No, not at all. Friends keep telling friends about whole life insurance from Colonial Pen. With this coverage, your premium never increases for any reason, and your benefit won't decrease simply because you grow older. If you're over 50, you cannot be turned down. Colonial Pen Life Insurance Company specializes in protection for mature men and women. To find out more, call now. Call toll-free 1-800-235-8000 for free information. And receive this handy guide to Social Security absolutely free. That's 1-800-235-8000. Hello, Colonial Pen. Call now for your free information and your free book. That's 1-800-235-8000. Call now. There's no obligation. 1-800-235-8000. Who's giving up their office to work at home? Dad is. We're going to show you how families and companies are benefiting from it. Coming up on CBS This Morning. Birth control after the fact? Sound like an impossibility? It's not, but has your doctor heard of it? That story tomorrow on CBS News Up to the Minute. This pesticide is everywhere. Works great on bugs, but what's it doing to you? We were breathing it, drinking it, touching it. An eye-to-eye -eye investigation, Thursday. Watch CBS This Morning. It's breakfast in your head. They make them tough in Iowa where the winters are anything but warm. More than 150 people turned up over the weekend for the annual community picnic in Lake Manawa. It was 20 degrees, but that didn't stop them from building a bonfire and toasting marshmallows in between the snow fights. There's more to this than just cold, clean fun. Picnickers brought extra clothes to donate to a local homeless shelter. Now here's a look at your weather forecast this morning. Rain and mountain snow will continue in the west. A cold front will move into southern California. Flurries will fall in Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas. The Rockies have temperatures in the 40s. Texas will see a high of 70 degrees. The mercury in the northeast will range from 0 to 20. Kansas is up to number three in this week's college basketball rankings. The Jayhawks were up to no good last night as far as Missouri was concerned. The Tigers There's had no won 16 in a row in the Big Eight before Scott Pollard and company came to Columbia. Pollard led the Jayhawks with 22 points, a career high. He had help from Jared Haas, who had 18 points. As Kansas improved to 11-1 with a 102-89 win, Missouri is now 10-2. Eighth-ranked Syracuse had its hands full with Villanova and Alvin Williams, who hit back-to-back -back threes for the Wildcats up 56-55. Lawrence Moten missed his first six three-point attempts, but hit the seventh to put Syracuse back up. Villanova's last chance went to Williams, but he traveled, and Syracuse won it 61-60.
that does it for us for this half hour. This is CBS News, up to the minute. My father used to say that he, uh, he started Gramercy Press so that the written word would always have a home. And uh, that mission hasn't changed. But it's 1994, and the era of Charles Dickens is over. We use computers, and we still mail manuscripts around the world. Curtis still prints a catalog every quarter and drops them in the mailbox. And our most advanced form of communication is Darlene's lovely little message slip. <laughs> We've been uh, talking to MCI, and this is not about the phone bill, but we're going to make some changes. Not in our ideals, but in the tools that we use. Everybody had an opinion. I think it's a great idea. We are finally waking up. What's wrong with Charles Dickens? It's appropriate. Art is constant. Tools change. Digital technology is the future. Whether you're selling books or bagels. The fact was, Peter had big plans that would change the way everybody did everything around here. Come in. Hi. You wanted to see me about this? Darlene, where are my messages? Did I get any messages? Oh, sure. They're on your email. Email? Oh, I want paper. Well, just print them out. They're right there on your email. Would Dickens use email? Would uh, uh, Fitzgerald? Would Shakespeare use email? Well, they would now. Look, I started door-to-door -door sales. You know, that's about as hard as you can get, right? Curtis is going to be happier than anybody in the whole world. Curtis! <laughs> I'm being very popular sort of a guy around the office. Well, I haven't seen a lot of him lately, which is kind of kind of a good thing. What's the latest with Darlene? Oh, forget that. Check this out. I can get our entire winter catalog out to 2,000 bookstores just like that. And press this button, you get an entire summary of the book. Just like that? Interactive. Cool. Uh-huh. I love technology. <laughs> oh, Reggie. Reggie already knows this stuff. He's been waiting for this to get here. Yesterday, Reginald was in an unusual hurry. Martin here. West Indies just won. How on earth do you know? It's on my computer. You owe me five bucks, old sport. Cricket? How can you have a sport named after a bug? You know, I'm finding there's some pride is I, I'm getting more done in four or five hours at home. He can be at his place in the country. I can be here at, at my office in Manhattan. She can be down in La Jolla. I don't have to get on a plane and leave the beach. And that's the greatest gift of all. <laughs> okay, here's the latest scenario. Peter's in heaven. He can sit at home looking at the contracts to death on the 18th hole. Nicole, you really don't have to worry about it. Well, simultaneously, the author has it on her screen. Do you think we could talk about this promotional tour for a few minutes? Well, simultaneously, the company's attorney in Manhattan has it on his screen. Outline paragraphs one and four. Right. And they can all work together on it. Very intimate. But if you ask me, there's one thing they're not seeing. She has the victim die a hundred feet from the green with an exploding driver. When everybody knows, he'd be using a wedge, not a driver at that point. What she should have done is install a liquid explosive in the ball washing machine. So when he goes to wash him, boom. But what do I know? That's a bestseller. You know, at first I thought she was, she was going to resist it. But I mean, I was in on it. I mean, I knew we were approaching this. Really? Yeah. But then the more, there was some stuff I saw, and I thought, this is for her. So, Mr. Rousset, what you doing? Surfing the internet. Don't look like a beach boy. I'm editing Blood of the Pharaoh. This is from the University of Cairo. That's Queen Nefertiti. Cool. Hey, you guys kind of look alike. Well, Martin? Martin is a wonderful man. I mean, he comes from the, the typewriter set, you know? I can get our entire winter catalog out to 2,000 bookstores just like that. This is going to give me all the news on sports books and women's books from anywhere in the world. We're going to make some changes. Not in our ideals, but in the tools that we use.
first total package of online video conferencing and messaging services for American business is now available for your business. Call now and experience the 21st century at a special introductory rate. Good morning, this is CBS News Up to the Minute. I'm Troy Roberts. Here's what's happening this morning. The ceasefire has crumbled in the capital of Chechnya only hours after a 48-hour truce began. There are reports of shelling in Grozny. Russian soldiers and Chechen rebels are exchanging small arms fire this morning. Russian officials called for the action and ordered Muslim rebels in the breakaway republic to surrender. The clash follows another day of heavy fighting near the capital. CBS News senior European correspondent Tom Fenton reports. Grozny is burning from end to end as the Russians rain high explosives on the shattered city. In 10 days of siege, the once feared Russian army has still been unable to defeat the small band of Chechen fighters stubbornly defending the presidential palace. But this David and Goliath conflict is not just confined to the center of Grozny. As we drove through the outskirts of the city, a Russian armored personnel carrier hiding in the woods for the past nine days ventured out on the main road. Someone yelled, there's a tank coming. Two Chechen fighters hid behind a barricade. And after a pause for courage, the armored vehicle decided to make a break for open country, firing as it came down the highway. As it limped by with a burst tire, it fired again. If the Russians thought they were free, they were wrong. Their nightmare was just beginning. A ragtag pack of Chechens took up the chase. For a couple of miles, they stalked the wounded machine along a tree-lined country road, through fields, and then they found it trying to hide on the edge of the woods. By now, the Chechens had been reinforced, and it took them no more than half an hour of relentless fire to claim their prize and loot it. There was plenty of ammunition and apparently plenty of vodka, too, but no Russians. The crew has fled on foot and is being hunted across open countryside full of armed Chechens. This has already become a guerrilla war. There is terror of a different kind in the Chechen countryside. In an attempt to find 47 paratroopers captured on New Year's Eve, the Russians have given five Chechen villages an ultimatum. Deliver our men or we will wipe you out. As night fell across the landscape blackened by oil fires, the Russian helicopters were already up and cruising. Tom Fenton, CBS News, outside Grozny. Back in this country, House Speaker Newt Gingrich has fired the House historian he appointed just last week. Gingrich acted after questions were raised about Dr. Christina Jeffries' role on a 1986 panel opposing U.S. funding for a Holocaust course. The panel complained the course did not include a Nazi perspective. Accused abortion clinic gunman John Salvi was in court yesterday wearing a bulletproof vest. Salvi pleaded not guilty to state charges of murder and attempted murder. His lawyer called Salvi, quote, very impressionable and said the main question at the trial will not be what happened, but why. Judge Lance Ito announced that jurors in the O.J. Simpson case will be sequestered as of tomorrow. The decision is rooted in the sheer volume of publicity surrounding the case. CBS News correspondent Bill Whitaker reports. I don't see so many smiles at this point. We will try to make this uh, something less than an experience of, for example, going into incarceration. Uh, it'll be, but it won't be a picnic. He's sequestering the jurors to keep them away from things like this, an eye-catching computer-generated tabloid mock-up of a battered Nicole Simpson, this salacious book by Nicole's self-proclaimed best friend, Faye Resnick, and now this, a soon-to-be-released I Didn't Do It book by O.J. Simpson. His New York publisher says it's Simpson's response to the 300,000 letters the defense claims he's received from people concerned about his pain and suffering. Though the book could net him $1 million under California's Son of Sam law, if he's found guilty, the money is supposed to be set aside for the victims. But even if he is convicted, if he makes the money now and spends all the money now, there may be nothing left from the book proceeds to put into a victim's trust fund. CBS News has learned murder victim Ron Goldman's family called Nicole's family last night livid about O.J.'s book. Nicole's family has cooperated with yet another book about O.J. and Nicole. And the public can make a decision between something that a journalist wrote, uh, talking to many, many people, and something that a defendant wrote. 
A defendant hard-pressed to pay his legal bills. With the jury still not sequestered until Wednesday, Judge Ito is going to have to question them once again about all this media hype before opening statements. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Los Angeles. And we'll be back with more news after this break. This is CBS News, up to the minute. Sleep deprivation. 70 million Americans have experienced it, but you don't have to. Try maximum strength sleep in all soft gels with the sleep aid preferred by 7 out of 10 doctors. Sleep in all soft gels help you fall asleep fast. Now there's a new hearing aid for Miracle Ear. So advanced, it's virtually invisible. Now you see it. Now you don't. It's the new Mirage hearing aid for Miracle Ear. Call now. We'll send you these free booklets that tell you how the virtually invisible Mirage may help you hear better. If you call 1-800-203-2500. Right now, we'll also send you this free videotape, Hearing Loss in You. It'll show you the most common causes and solutions for hearing loss. And we'll include the free booklets about the new Mirage hearing aid for Miracle Ear. You see, Mirage is our most advanced hearing aid that fits completely into the ear canal. It's not only small, it's virtually invisible. Call Miracle Ear at 1-800-203-2500. We'll send you important new information about hearing loss and the virtually invisible Mirage. It's amazing. I know he's wearing it, but I can't see it. So call Miracle Ear at 1-800-203-2500. Call now. She's at that certain age. She's not an infant anymore. She's not quite a young lady. She's a toddler. Too big for a bottle. Not big enough for a glass. Ah, uh, this is just right. New Next Step Toddler Formula from the makers of Enfamil. Specially designed for toddlers with the Iron Cow's Milk Wax. Here, sweetheart. After the bottle, before the milk. New Next Step Toddler Formula in soy, too. Natural Herb Cough Drops, a pleasant-tasting blend of organically grown herbs and other natural ingredients from Switzerland. It may be hard to believe, but once there was something called privacy in this country. Private meant none of your business. Even public people had privacy. The president had privacy. That was a long time ago, back when the press and the presidency were in bed with each other. CBS News correspondent Bernard Goldberg reports. We face the future with confidence and with courage. We are Americans. Once upon a time, the President of the United States was bigger than life. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, elected president four times. A man who said things that wound up in history books. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But FDR and his wife Eleanor also had private lives, which in those days, believe it or not, were actually private. Historian and author Doris Kearns Goodwin. Well, what is so amazing to me to realize is that in the White House, not only are Franklin and Eleanor living in the family quarters, but right above Franklin Roosevelt's bedroom is his secretary, Missy Lahan, who's really his other wife. And then there was Princess Martha of Norway, who during World War II moved into the White House. She was beautiful, and she had long legs, and she wore high heels, and they would teasingly call her his girlfriend. And Franklin wasn't the only one with a close female friend living in the White House. Eleanor had one also, a former reporter named Lorena Hickok. The two wrote letters back and forth that are filled with intimacy, filled with I can't wait to hug and kiss you. Lorena's living there in the White House. She later goes on to live with other women. Can you imagine what somebody would have made of that? And if you're saying, gee, I didn't know any of that. Don't feel bad. The American people who elected President Roosevelt didn't know any of that either, thanks to a press corps that didn't report any of that. Was he having an affair with her? He had an affair with her for years. Walter Trohan covered the Roosevelt White House for the Chicago Tribune. He's 91, and he's talking about FDR's relationship with Missy Lahan, his secretary. Did you write about it? Uh, no. Did you not report some of these private matters out of respect for his privacy? It was his privacy, but it was it was the press code. Not individually, but the press. And the code said what, basically? Well, the, 
we don't go into the private, private life. We don't divulge that. Privacy for a president, it's history. <laughs> Mr. Clinton exposed himself to me that day. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. Governor Clinton, Do you think you've put questions about infidelity behind you? The White House may not have changed much since President Roosevelt lived here, but our notion about privacy and the presidency sure has. The very idea that reporters would have asked FDR about his sex life is unthinkable, about as preposterous as someone asking the President of the United States of America about his underwear. Mr. President, the world's dying to know, is it boxers or briefs? Usually briefs. I thought, on the one hand, uh, here's the President of the United States on MTV being asked about his underwear, what has this society come to? And then my second thought was, my God, he answered it. <laughs> Howard Kurtz is the media critic for the Washington Post, who says the press is more uninhibited these days because... Society is more uninhibited these days. Howard, can you imagine anybody, anybody asking Franklin Roosevelt about his underwear? It boggles the mind to even contemplate. In the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, television shows, sitcoms, didn't show married couples sleeping in the same bed. I mean, there were lots of things that simply weren't discussed in public. Now, it seems everything is discussed in public. And so the media, which still think of themselves as a serious-minded institution, um, have become like all of entertainment. We pander to all this kind of uh, titillating stuff that people are interested in. Are you prepared tonight to say that you've never had an extramarital affair? Now, questions like that wind up in the most legitimate places. This is 60 Minutes. A couple of buddies. And it's because the mainstream media that used to scorn tabloids and their sex scandals are now taking their lead from those very same tabloids. There is an extensive series of reports in today's New York Post alleging that a former U.S. ambassador, a man now deceased, had told several persons that he arranged for a sexual tryst involving you and one of your female staffers in Geneva in 1984. I'm not going to take any sleazy questions like that from CNN. I am very disappointed that you would ask such a question of me. And uh, I will not respond to it. I have Now character has become this all-purpose fig leaf. We can report any story, no matter how sleazy, no matter how personal, and say, well, this tells us something about the person's character. Do you believe that adultery is immoral? Yes. Have you ever committed adultery? Um, I, I, I do not have to answer that question. I think we're going too far today, but I don't think maybe we went Far enough then. Let's say you called your editor back in Chicago. Oh, I told my editors about this, yes. You did? Oh, yeah. And let's say you said to them, I want to write a story about President Roosevelt and Missy. Oh, no way. <laughs> they wouldn't let me. No way. No way. It was just assumed that nobody would ask him questions that intruded on his private life. Doris Kearns Goodwin tells us just how different things used to be in her latest biography, No Ordinary Time. The press, she says, not only revealed nothing about FDR's relationships, incredibly, it revealed virtually nothing about, well, just listen to this. The President of the United States, FDR, is paralyzed. Paralyzed. He can't walk without help. He can't even get out of his bed in the morning without calling for his valet to help him into his wheelchair to get to the bathroom. And no one had any conception of that, except the people who worked with him closely. I'm a tough guy. And the public knew that he'd had polio, but simply assumed that he was lame. They thought he could walk. They thought he could get around. This is astounding that the, the president is paralyzed and the press doesn't report it. I find it impossible to imagine if a new reporter or a new photographer came on the scene and tried to snap a picture of Roosevelt in his wheelchair looking crippled being carried the older photographer would knock the camera to the ground or block the shot with his body of the 25,000 pictures in the Roosevelt archives only two show him in a wheelchair during his 12 years in the White House not a single news photo was ever published showing him like this I've carried Roosevelt so obviously the press corps knew that Roosevelt couldn't walk. Oh, we knew it all the time. But why wouldn't the press flat out say, 
President Roosevelt, who has polio, is paralyzed and can't walk. Ninety-some percent of the press was heart and soul with Roosevelt. And they didn't want us there. FDR, who could no more walk than fly, conspired with the press to mask his paralysis with a remarkable deception. He had thick braces on his legs, from his ankles, really up to um, above his knees. And the braces kept his legs locked into place. So if he were stood up, if he were helped to a standing position, and then he were leaning on the arms of two strong people, sometimes his son, sometimes a secret service man, then with the momentum of them walking along, he could seem to be walking down an aisle, even though he had no power on his own part to walk on his own. We've moved from averting our eyes from the wheelchair to telling you whether the president has briefs or boxes. Now uh, we've become, the media become kind of a national nanny, and we poke our, our noses into every conceivable corner of private behavior. Okay, I think it's part of a whole difference in the culture. I mean, there was a, a deeper sense on the part of everybody in their everyday life back in the 1930s and 40s that there were boundaries around private life. It's inconceivable to imagine people in the 30s and 40s, forget the president, going on the equivalent of Oprah Winfrey or Phil Donahue and talking about their abusive stepfather. My, my stepfather, as you know, we had some problems growing up, but he was very good to me. It's been called the Oprahization of America, and politicians are in on it. Tell the world about your personal life, and maybe they'll like you more. Kind of got, he got violent with my mother one night, and I just broke through the door and told him he wasn't going to do that anymore. I never stopped loving my stepfather. I think he was a really good person. But and before you weep for President Clinton, or any other politician about some loss of privacy, says Doris Goodwin, remember this lesson. When you publicly discuss your personal life, don't be shocked when others do too. Once the politicians walk down that path of revealing those parts of their past that they think are going to help them at that moment, make them look positive, make them get accepted by the people, they can't then turn around and say to the press, okay, but you can't see this other part of my life. These pictures, which we've all seen a million times, may seem harmless, but there's a theory that they chip away at the respect Americans have for the presidency. You know the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. It just might. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days. The key to a democratic done. leader in our society is somehow to retain some of the majesty of whatever is part of the presidency still, but to be able to relate to the common man. But you don't do it by giving up that part of yourself that is private. Once you do that, you're lost. I can't be truthful and say that I'm glad to get back. I'm awfully So sorry which was again. better? The old days when the press consciously and willingly kept the president's secrets? Happy birthday, Mr. President. Or today, when privacy seems to be a four-letter word. I think that we will never go back to the days of FDR where reporters knew all the secrets and didn't share them with the public. Now we share them with the public, even when we're not quite sure whether they're true or not. Sister, what's our campaign slogan? But it was easier back then. All Roosevelt had to contend with was polio and World War II. If he also had to deal with television, with the man who couldn't walk, even run. Carnation hot cocoa drinkers are trying hot, rich chocolate Ovaltine. I was surprised. I didn't like Ovaltine as a child, but this is good. It's creamy. It's kind of a thick consistency. And it's chocolatey. It's smooth. Hot, rich chocolate Ovaltine is made with milk. It tastes creamy and is more nutritious than hot cocoa. It doesn't taste watery. It tastes like real cocoa. If I had a choice, I'd buy the rich chocolate Ovaltine. Hot, rich chocolate Ovaltine. Compare it to your hot cocoa and taste the difference. If you use ordinary powders like Johnson's Baby Powder or Shower to Shower on your red, irritated, itchy skin, you may not be getting the medication you need. What you may need is Gold Bond Medicated Powder. Johnson's and Shower to Shower do not contain medication. Gold Bond does. Its triple action formula has the absorbing action of a powder plus the medicating action of a proven itch fighter and the drying action of zinc oxide. So if you've been using ordinary powder to relieve your red, itchy skin, try Gold Bond Medicated Powder and regular and extra strength. Gold Bond, more than a powder, it's medication. 
sleep deprivation. 70 million Americans have experienced it, but you don't have to. Try maximum strength sleep in all soft gels with the sleep aid preferred by 7 out of 10 doctors. Sleep in all soft gels help you fall asleep fast. Everyone's talking about low fat, but not everyone's losing weight. My doctor told me that to lose weight, you have to cut both fat and calories. That's why I chose the Ultra Slim Fast Plan, and I lost 50 pounds in six months. Each shake is low in fat, the calories are counted, and nutrition, it's all in there. A shake for breakfast and lunch, delicious candy bars as snacks, and a sensible dinner. So come on, start Ultra Slim Fast today. For me, it's the ultimate way to lose weight. Now save $2 on the handy new six-pack. Ricola. <laughs> Ricola. Ricola. Natural herb cough drops. A pleasant tasting blend of organically grown herbs and other natural ingredients from Switzerland. To report the story well, you've got to go there. Be there. Hear it firsthand. See the difference. Experience CBS News. Who's giving up their office to work at home? Dad is. We're going to show you how families and companies are benefiting from it. Coming up on CBS This Morning. Birth control after the fact sound like an impossibility? It's not, but has your doctor heard of it? That story tomorrow on CBS News up to the minute. Watch CBS This Morning. It's breakfast between your head. They make them tough in Iowa, where the winters are anything but warm. More than 150 people turned up over the weekend for the annual community picnic in Lake Manawa. It was 20 degrees, but that didn't stop them from building a bonfire and toasting marshmallows in between the snow fights. There's more to this than just cold, clean fun. Picnickers brought extra clothes to donate to a local homeless shelter. Now here's a look at your weather forecast this morning. Rain and mountain snow will continue in the west. A cold front will move into Southern California. Flurries will fall in Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas. The Rockies have temperatures in the 40s. Texas will see a high of 70 degrees. The mercury in the northeast will range from zero to 20. Former Philadelphia Philly Mike Schmidt is the only player voted in baseball's Hall of Fame this year. In 18 seasons, Schmidt hit 548 home runs, seventh on the all-time list. He's one of 12 players to hit four home runs and as many at-bats in one game. Schmidt won three National League Most Valuable Player Awards and was the World Series MVP in 1980. He also owns 10 gold gloves. I would like to be remembered as a guy who knew knew how to win and wanted to win more than anything. Guy who sacrificed uh, a lot of uh, physical uh, makeup over the years for the sport, for the team. I want to be known as a game. I'd like to be remembered as a game. Meanwhile, the Toronto Blue Jays will hold tryout camps for replacement players in Southern California this weekend. They'll have two more in Florida next weekend in hopes of putting together a roster for spring training games beginning in March. The Blue Jays are forbidden by Ontario law from using replacement players in Toronto during the strike. Talks between National League players and owners are continuing this morning. The last major issue to be settled is reportedly the age for unlimited free agency. Owners say it should be 32. Players want it to be 30. They're working against a deadline currently set at noon. If there is no agreement by then, the season will be canceled. <laughs>
Newark's only 24-hour news channel. This is a News 4 update. Good morning. It's 18 degrees at 355. I'm Mary Murray. L.A. Judge Lance Edel told O.J. Simpson's jury to begin preparing for their lives to start changing tomorrow. The 12 jurors and 12 alternate jurors will begin being sequestered Wednesday. Judge Edel told the jurors that they'd be allowed to have one family visit during the week and one on the weekend during the trial. And today marks the 102nd day in the lockout between NHL owners and players. Free agency continues to be a major stumbling block between the two sides as the race against the clock winds down. Both sides have until noon today to come to terms, or the NHL season will be scrapped. We'll have more news in an hour on your only 24-hour news channel. Four stands for news. 24 hours a day. When you want a hot meal without a big deal, what are you going to pick? Hot pocket. When a holy bunk shows up for lunch, what are you going to pick? Hot pocket. Hot pocket. Filled with delicious pepperoni pizza, chicken and cheddar, or ham and cheese in a crispy pocket. When it's late at night and you want a tasty bite, what are you going to pick? Hot pocket. The hot meal in a pocket. What are you going to pick? Try Lean Pockets, too. Sam here is giving me enough good reasons to use my Dirt Devil hand vac, but now he's giving me five more. When they turn the house upside down, I turn on my Dirt Devil. This powerful revolving brush tears into dirt, chews up crumbs, and picks up pet hair. It has an extra long cord, and it's lightweight. So, I'd say my Dirt Devil is a pick of the litter. Right, Sam? <laughs> Right. Get a dirt devil and put the power and upright in the palm of your hand. Four stands for news. 24 hours a day. Being Western New York's only 24-hour news channel means you can depend, depend on, on us, us for an informative summary of the top stories and breaking news. At the beginning of every hour, day and night, seven days a week. We call ski country this week. Warm weather is raising the threat of avalanches. So in Provo Canyon, sightseers are being warned that looking can be hazardous to your health. Robert Waltz reports. The signs cry out the warning, danger, do not stop, avalanche area, but some people just don't get it. So you probably had to park uh, far one way or the other and then maybe walk up and be ready to run, but this is not a good place to be stopping. Wow. Doug Hansen is continually shooing people out of the parking lot at the base of Bridal Veil Falls in Provo Canyon. Every few years, a monstrous avalanche thunders down the canyon bringing snow, trees, and rocks from thousands of feet above the Provo River. Hundreds of tons of snow uh, plug off the river, destroy buildings, and if you happen to be parked in the wrong place, definitely your car. Hansen says conditions are ripe for another major avalanche here, as they are in other areas of the Wasatch Front. Forest Service officials agreed, saying the danger is extreme this year due to the recent cycle of cold, warm, and rainy weather. And that creates a base that becomes very solid, and then we get very soft snow that's on top of it, and any movement at all will, will cause the snow to slide right off. The Forest Service advises backcountry skiers and snowmobilers to beware and make sure they know what they're getting into. Rangers say they should call to check avalanche danger and tell authorities where they are going in case they don't make it back. I'm Robert Walls for CBS News. And that's our news for this half hour. This is CBS News, up to the minute. husband died, science gave her his child. But the government says her little girl has no father. Who's right? Eye on America tonight on the CBS Evening News. Is this the cure for cancer? She bet her life on it. Do medical miracles really exist? 48 Hours Investigates, Thursday. This is CBS. Round-the-clock weather. Call the Skywatch 4 Dunn Tire Weather Line.
Now on CBS News, up to the minute, a ceasefire plan for peace in Chechnya crumbles. And on the weather watch in the wild, wild west. Good morning, this is CBS News, up to the minute. I'm Troy Roberts, here's what's happening this morning. A ceasefire offered by Russia is quickly collapsing this morning in the Chechen capital of Grozny. Only hours after the 48-hour truce began, shelling and small arms fire continued between Russian soldiers and rebel troops. Moscow called a ceasefire yesterday and ordered the Chechen rebels to lay down their arms. The latest offer came at the end of a brutal day of fighting. David Chater of British Sky News is on the scene now in Grozny. A bloody stalemate has descended on Grozny. Russian jets were once again flying sorties over the city, sending people scattering for cover. But Chechen tanks are controlling the streets in the center of the rebel capital. The Russian advance is still stalled about a mile down the street behind me, in places they're only about 400 yards from the presidential palace, but the resistance they're meeting from the Chechen fighters is fierce. The presidential palace is still the heart of the rebel resistance. The fighters here are in direct line of fire from the Russian front. The basement has become a field hospital without any drugs or painkillers. There's little shelter here from the force of the Russian artillery. The casualties are pouring back from the front line, but there's only one surgeon left in the city. He's having to perform amputations without anesthetics. There are no ambulances left to take the injured fighters to the makeshift wards. A Red Cross volunteer pinned down for the last four days on the front line gave a graphic account of the conditions there. The Chechens offered the Russians to cease for ceasefire so the Russians can take away the death which were come from the destroyed tanks. The bodies are lying in the streets. You see only uh, skeletons eaten by dogs. A Russian paratroop major captured two days ago was put on display in Grozny. His men, the supposed elite of the Russian army, now under Chechen guard. And the Russian artillery bombardment continues to maim and kill the civilians here, driving those who can still walk from their homes. David Chater, Sky News, Grozny. Back in this country, the new House historian hired last week by Speaker Newt Gingrich is out of a job this morning. Gingrich fired Christina Jeffrey last night after learning she once recommended against federal funding for a Holocaust course because it failed to include a Nazi viewpoint. Question about her views, Jeffrey says she does not have an anti-Semitic bone in her body. Published reports say House Republican leaders have been told in private by their budget analysts that to deliver tax cuts and balance the budget, they would need to cut growth in Medicare spending for older Americans and medical coverage to the poor by nearly $500 billion. Publicly, Republican leaders will only say Social Security is off the table for possible cuts, at least for now. California is once again being battered by unrelenting Pacific storms. In the southern part of the state, Los Angeles Mayor Richard Reardon has declared a state of emergency in anticipation of a third storm that could bring up to four inches of rain. And in Northern California, heavy rain is causing some of the region's worst flooding in nearly a decade. Tim Daly is on the scene there. Good morning, Tim. You're in Sonoma County. What's the story? Well, good morning to you, Troy. We're about 10 miles northwest of the city of Santa Rosa, which is about an hour north of San Francisco. We're not far from the town of Guerneville, which traditionally gets flooded. And as you peek behind me here, you can see the kind of flooding that has occurred here. About 10 feet of that barn is underwater. The river that has swollen, the Russian River, is a good half mile beyond that barn. That shows you just how far the water has come. The towns and people of Sonoma County are losing the battle tonight. Their homes are swallowed by an expanding Russian River. It's about 12 feet deep on the streets and faster than the river normally flows. It's, un it's unreal. They're threatened by raging streams, which used to be non-threatening creeks. This trailer used to, used to be this way. <laughs> it's now that way. A Santa Rosa woman helps her Forestville sister, hoping she'll move out of this area. I want her to come home. I don't like it. I'm nervous wreck with her being out here. So we've been trying to get in out here and 
something crazy. The sister and her roommate wouldn't think of living anywhere else. I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. <laughs> but look at this. I know. A lot of cleanup. But no. This is once every 10 years. Yeah. Okay. This is once every 10 years. But when this isn't happening, it's beautiful out here. Numerous roads are flooded and unusable. Hundreds of people have been forced out. It's like very wet, flooding, uh, lots of debris through the river. No water. That was the biggest concern. So looks like it's going to go on for the week. So we decided to leave. Mud slide coming down on my house. So we got out. The Russian River floods every few years, but every 10 years or so, it delivers a serious blow to western Sonoma County. The Guerneville area hasn't been soaked like this since 1986. Now, for the first time in a long time, for the last couple of days, the rain isn't pounding on us here in Sonoma County, but it is drizzling a little bit, and forecasters are saying it will rain heavily throughout the week. Back to you, Troy. Tim Daly in Sonoma County. Thank you. In other news, accused abortion clinic gunman John Salvi is being held without bail after his arraignment in Massachusetts. Wearing a bulletproof vest, Salvi pleaded not guilty yesterday to state charges of murder and attempted murder. Hinting at a possible defense strategy, his lawyer called Salvi, quote, a very impressionable young man and said the main question at the trial will not be what happened, but why. Jurors in the O.J. Simpson trial are packing their bags. Judge Lance Ito formally told them yesterday that they'll be sequestered at a secret location beginning tomorrow for the duration of the trial. CBS News correspondent Manuel Gallegas reports now from Los Angeles. O.J. Simpson's defense lawyers did not make any comments as they entered the criminal courts building. They immediately went into Judge Ito's chambers for about two and a half hours in a closed-door session. Then, just before noon, the 12 jurors and 12 alternates were brought back to the courtroom outside the view of the camera and were told about their sequestration. I'm going to formally sequester you starting on this Wednesday, uh, January the 11th. And what I'm going to do is order you to return uh, to a specific location. Ito then told the jurors from now on, sheriff's deputies would be handling them. He ordered them not to discuss anything about where they would be housed and told them they would have family visits once during the week and during the weekend. I realize that this is going to be very difficult for all of us. I want you to know that this has been something that we have all tried to avoid, but it has become necessary. The court then took up the issue of how many seats should be allotted for victims' family members in the press. They agreed on having seven each for the Brown and Goldman families, but where they would sit then became an issue. Lawyers argued about how close the victims' family members would have to sit near O.J. Simpson. But to move the victims' family to a position behind the defendant is unconscionable and unfair, and is, is nothing more than an effort to... Uh, basically discourage the victims' families from wanting to be present in the courtroom. So we are very concerned about the jury being distracted to look at people who are not on the witness stand and look at victims and the family in a very emotional case. Meanwhile, there is now the issue of O.J. Simpson's new book called I Want to Tell You. It's supposed to be out soon, and now the prosecution must determine if there's anything in the book relevant to their case, although legal analysts say it's more likely just an attempt at good publicity and to make money. Manuel Gallegas, CBS News, Los Angeles. Still ahead, jury selection gets underway in the trial of 12 Muslims accused of plotting a war of terror in the U.S. Also, the explosion at the World Trade Center was caused by a homemade bomb. Who besides a terrorist would make a homemade bomb? We'll tell you the surprising answer later in this morning's Eye on America. Talking 
Everything mattered. My choreography, my wardrobe, even my eyes. As a contact lens wearer, I know that good eye care is important. Regular eye checkups can detect vision problems early, and if you need correction, there's a wide variety of fun options that'll give you great vision. Make an appointment to see your eye care practitioner today. Remember, regular eye checkups are important. This message brought to you by the National Society to Prevent Blindness. It's a breath of fresh air from Buffalo in the morning. Ray and Sue, they have that natural chemistry. I like the Y guy, Kevin O'Neill. He's funny, he's cute, he's out in the community. I really like the way they uh, work together. With two cereal, Ray, Colin, and four, and you each day. This morning at 6 on Channel 4. It's your wake up call, wake up. In New York, jury selection is underway in the case of Sheikh Omar, Abdel Rahman, and 11 alleged followers. They're accused of plotting a war of urban terrorism against the United States. Mike Taibbi reports. The trial of Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and 11 of his associates and followers revolves around a single question. Is the 57-year-old Islamic fundamentalist merely a religious zealot who, like so many zealots, preaches the annihilation of his enemies? Or was he the key figure in an actual plot to assassinate those enemies, like Zionist Rabbi Meir Kahana, and to conduct the reign of terror and destruction, starting with New York City's tunnels, bridges, and landmark buildings? The Sheikh's lawyer says he is no conspirator. There's a line between what you preach and what you agree to, and this jury will decide that at some point, whether or not the evidence has proven that he entered into an agreement, not whether or not he knew these people, not whether or not he preached to these people, not whether he is a militant person. The jurors chosen will fill out a carefully constructed 20-page questionnaire that will explore their predispositions in the potentially explosive case. Among the questions, do you regularly use the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel, or the George Washington Bridge? Do you or any family members practice Islam? And do you have any negative or positive feelings about people of Arab descent? The pool reporters allowed into the courtroom of Judge Michael Mukasey quoted the judge as instructing the potential jurors that this is not a freedom of speech case. No one is charged here simply for having opinions or expressing opinions, which in this country is not a crime. Judge Mukasey has set aside this week and next for the potential jurors to fill out their questionnaires and then submit to questioning by both prosecution and defense lawyers. That's a part of the process called voir dire. After that, the trial could begin, and the judge himself has suggested that the trial could take eight months at least. Security will be tight throughout the trial. Judge Mukasey will be protected at all times by armed guards, and the movement of the defendant between the Metropolitan Correction Center and the courthouse each day will be monitored by U.S. Marshals, city cops, and courthouse personnel. Mike Taibbi with CBS News. Around the country, police department bomb squads are getting busier and busier. It's a disturbing trend made even more so when you learn just how easy it is to make a bomb. The fact is that instructions are now so readily available that a child can do it, and a shocking number of children are, as CBS News correspondent Bob McEwen reports in this morning's Island America. It came through the mail. Everybody out of the place? Everybody... It's a dirty job, but in New Jersey these days, someone's got to do it. Let's get the equipment out and set it up. In the past year, the state bomb squad answered almost 200 calls like this one. Suspicious packages, suspected letter bombs, and increasingly what this FBI tape shows, the real thing. Across the country, the number of bombing incidents per year has more than doubled since 1990. And it is the state of New Jersey that's considered to be the bomb capital of the U.S. Since the World Trade Center investigation, we've noticed a dramatic increase in the amount of live devices that we're encountering. The truck bomb that devastated the World Trade Center two years ago was made in New Jersey. Police believe the fire bomb that blew up in the New York subway last month was too. And the letter bomb that killed advertising executive Thomas Moser in November exploded in his New Jersey home. But it's not the incidents that made headlines that disturbed the bomb squad most. The larger number of devices that we encounter are from juveniles who get a kick out of making explosive devices to damage property. We have enough problems in America 
without our kids learning how to become junior terrorists. Armando Fontura is sheriff of Essex County, New Jersey, where this bomb-making manual was available to kids as young as 11 in their school library. Napalm, bomb is made easy. How do they got your neighbor? This is just atrocious. You have, you have information here that can be devastating. It can be devastating. Easily made. It has to stop somewhere. They just can't make this available to impressionable children. This man asked to remain anonymous. His 14-year-old son paid $9 and got the recipe for this pipe bomb from the Internet on his home computer. The directions are there, and every component needed is in your basement or under your sink. Incredibly, that 14-year-old boy had more than two dozen different devices to choose from, including fire bombs, plastic explosives, even nitroglycerin. Potential targets are listed, too, from Kmart, to McDonald's. The computer service that provides access to that information says simply it is not responsible for anything on the internet. But by using those computerized directions, this is the result. Everything that we used here, the young kid, teenager, can, can purchase and do their hands on out in the street. An extremely simple thing to put together. And imagine getting hit with some of this flying debris. It would cut you to pieces if it didn't kill you. Law enforcement agencies in many states are pushing Congress to restrict access to bomb-making material, both in print and online. I firmly believe that there's a connection between the availability of this type of information and the rash of incidents that we're finding. Grenade. Should the public really have the right to this kind of information? Mm -hmm. Authorities point to the lesson learned in New Jersey, that the more people know about making bombs, the more people will do it. In Somerville, New Jersey, this is Bob McEwen for Eye in America. If you've ever been bitten by the IRS audit bug, you know the sting can last a long time. Now meet a man who claims he has devised an audit repellent, some definitive ways to avoid a painful process. Amir Axel is the author of the book, How to Beat the IRS at Its Own Game, and he joins us now in our New York studio. Good morning. Morning. You got the idea for this book after you were audited back in 1991. It took up nearly two years of your life. And you figured out that the reason behind most audits is statistics, right? Yes. Uh, the IRS uses statistics in determining whom to audit. It's not a personal thing. They want statistically to improve their revenues to get as much as possible. So they're looking for rules that distinguish between people from whom they can get more money and people following an audit and people for whom they cannot get more money. So they use a statistical routine called discriminant analysis, and that gives them what they call the secret formula, which is a discriminant function. It looks at, at di it distinguishes between people from whom they, in the past, have been able to get more money, and people from whom, in the past, they were less uh, able to get more money in the audit. So it has nothing to do with your income at all? Well, I wouldn't say that, because people with higher income, it's not income alone. I had uh, in my data incomes that were pretty low and yet their deductions were pretty high. When you have high deductions against a particular income, that raises your ratio of deductions against the income and that's what triggers the uh, computer. That's what triggers the secret formula to pick you. However, it's not, uh, I would say that there is something else here. People with higher incomes have more things that they do with their money and when they do these things, they tend to raise their ratios. So you can't say the income doesn't have anything to do with it. So you figured every three years the IRS selects a random sample of, what, 50,000 people to put through the ringer? Yes. Well, that uh, was true until uh, just this weekend. The IRS commissioner in the nationally televised uh, interview This is written said, policy? Uh, well, the policy changes all the time, but they used to have a policy where they take about 50,000 every three years. Now we heard they're going to go to 150,000, which they really don't need. There's absolutely no reason for them to take that many people and uh, just uh, squeeze them in an endless audit. This is a very in-depth audit. It's not even a usual audit. It's an audit that takes longer, and they look at everything. This is how they learn about us taxpayers. They're doing statistics themselves. There's absolutely no reason to get such a large sample. I, with a thousand, uh, well, over a thousand taxpayers, was able to get good results by using the same methodology that the IRS uses. Okay, help us out here. What are the red flags that the auditors look out for on your return? 
Well, uh, the computer, which has the secret formula developed by the IRS, uh, looks at those ratios. And I found that 95%, roughly 95% of all audits I ca are caused when something, some trigger uh, mm -hmm. uh, goes off. And that trigger is based on deductions against your income, various deductions and various schedules. I Meaning, let's suppose you have a business and you have high expenses for a particular year. If these expenses are a large proportion of what you made as an income on that business, that may cause the computer to choose you for an audit. Now, the red flags are something else. These are things that the, that, uh, the IRS personnel will look for while they look at your audit that has been kicked uh, by the machine, kicked out by the machine. Aren't you concerned now that you've written this book on how to beat the IRS, that they're going to exact revenge on you? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to hear that the commissioner responded to my book, and I hope that the IRS improves the way they do things. Um, I don't think that doing more audits that are used statistically to gain information is a way to go. As a statistician, I know that there are much more powerful methods the IRS could use, and if they like to think, at, uh, if, if we think of people who cheat on their taxes as a mm -hmm. cancer in society, you want to cut that cancer out, not with a Stone Age tool, which is what I believe they're using statistically, but rather with modern technology that will leave the uh, healthy tissue alone, people like me, <laughs> yes. you, and get the people who cheat on taxes only. So the modern methodologies, uh, if you think of computers, the methodology used by the IRS, discriminant function was developed in the 30s. You know that there are no computers then, and even 10 years ago, a computer that's right here, right. Uh, around here, on your desk, used to fill an entire room. So there's a lot of places to go. They can improve tremendously. I've met IRS statisticians in meetings, and I know well, they have a lot to learn. I, I, can. I can see they got under your skin here, Amir. <laughs> Amir Axel, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be back after this. This is CBS News up to the minute. Ricola is blended from organically grown...